The Standard Deviations podcast is a weekly production that looks at money, mind, and meaning, all through a psychological lens. Each week, psychologist and New York Times bestselling author Dr. Daniel Crosby interviews a fascinating new guest, experts in everything from finance to literature to wellness. When was the last time you splurged on something when you knew it probably conflicted with one of your financial goals, like paying down debt or saving for future fun in retirement? Well, if you do this, you're not alone. It's because of present bias, or to use the psychobabble term, hyperbolic discounting. As humans, we have a tendency to let the immediate rewards of the here and now win out over a desired future reality. To learn more, check out the Cash Dash Dash, a planning tool brought to you by The Guardian Network to see just how much your short-term spins might be impacting your longer-term financial goals. Play today by visiting www.livingconfidently.com slash play. Hello and welcome to the Standard Deviations Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Daniel Crosby, and I am joined today by my friend Larry Swedro, who is the Director of Research at the BAM Alliance. Larry has dedicated his life to educating others about prudent ways to invest, and he's here today to share some of that wisdom with us, uh, specifically as it's found in his latest book, Your Complete Guide to a Successful and Secure Retirement. Welcome to the show, Larry. Great to be with you, Daniel, and uh, just a uh, heads up for your listeners, uh, a must read uh, is Daniel's own book on behavioral finance. Well, look, we're done here, Larry. That's all I needed from you. I just needed, I just needed you to plug my book. I have nothing else to say. No, thank you very much. You've been, you've been very kind adding my book to your list of, I think, the top 14 or 15 behavioral finance books was a big honor for me, so thank you for that. And my pleasure. Well deserved. Yeah, so Larry is coming to us today from St. Louis, and we need to begin this conversation, Larry, talking about the most important things in life, which is baseball. Are, are you a Cardinals fan? Well, I have to admit, I grew up in the Bronx, just uh, northeast of the Bronx Zoo, so I'm still a diehard Yankee fan. Uh, but uh, now in St. Louis for 33 years, as long as the Cardinals are not playing the Yankees, I'm also a diehard Cardinal fan. So the Cardinals and the Yankees, well, the Yankees and the Cardinals, uh, respectively, are one-two in all-time World Series rings. So uh, it's a good, it's a good place to to hang your hat. So well done. I'm a huge Cardinals fan. Hoping we can take in a game one of these days. So and I will tell you that the Cardinal fans, in my opinion, having been in lots of ballparks around the country, are without question the best baseball fans in America. Well, there's, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's. Among Cardinals fans, they would say that they're the best fans in baseball. That gets used derisively by, I think, people who don't agree. But, but I, I certainly find Cardinals fans to be knowledgeable and polite and, and great patrons of the game. So it's, it's a good group to be a part of. And I'm third generation, so proud, proud to be part of that. So I want to dig into your book, which is absolutely fantastic. It is enormously comprehensive for anyone who is thinking about retirement from literally every single angle. It's a, it's a must read. Uh, the name of it, again, is Your Complete Guide to a Successful and Secure Retirement. Uh, one of the things that I like that you talked about early in the book was you talked about some of the non-financial elements of a successful retirement. You know, these you have these 10 key elements. Uh, they have purpose, fun, giving back, and a host of others. Uh, I think this is one of the most overlooked pieces of planning for retirement. We all know that we need money. We're all setting aside for that, right? But there's also a, a lot of psychological considerations when planning for retirement. So which of these key elements do you think get, get overlooked or ignored as folks start to plan for retirement? Well, I'm glad you uh, raised this issue, Daniel, because uh, we think uh, Kevin Grogan and I, are co- my co-author, that this issue was so important while so many people focus uh, when they do any planning on the financial aspects and maybe the legal issues related uh, to estate planning, uh, they fail to focus on planning a meaningful life in retirement. And so we made that the first chapter of the book. And the key things that, that people miss are that when you're at work, you're generally 
accomplishing two, the two most important things for, for being happy. Uh, number one is that's where you get the, your social relationships, your connections, your friendships, because uh, you spend so much time there. And the second thing is you have what I call this reason to get up in the morning, a sense of purpose, fulfillment, accomplishment. And without those things, if you don't plan to replace them with other things, you can end up with serious problems. And I'll just cite two, two statistics. When I learned them, I had an incredible impression on me. And the first thing is, if I were asked uh, which cohort of the population had the highest suicide rate, I would have guessed young, maybe teenage girls. I did lose a sister, unfortunately, uh, to suicide. Um, and it's not them. It's actually recently retired men. Uh, and that's because they've lost that purpose, that sense of accomplishment, those friendships, uh, et cetera, the social connections. And the second one is uh, that the highest cohort of divorces in the United States is what is now being called the silver divorces because the typical of my generation anyway is the wife says, I married you for better or worse, but not for lunch. And now all of a sudden this other person is there 24 hours a day when the wife uh, has established her own life and connections and purpose and stuff. And now all of a sudden this person wants to be there 24 hours and is looking for them to help them find that purpose and friendship. So you really need to plan. And uh, I rec we highly recommend a book called Your Retirement Quest by Alan Spector, who helped me write this chapter. Well, it's a it's a fascinating and important point to bring up because for the first time in the history of the United States in peacetime, um, life expectancy is dropping, and it's due primarily to suicide, uh, and it's due to, of course, drug addiction, opioid addiction in particular. And so we we're all, I think, very at least all of us who work in finance are sort of intimately acquainted with the, the financial crisis, like the lack of preparedness financially that we're looking at as a country for retirement. Uh, but there's also a crisis of meaning that's equally significant. And when you look at the research, you know, research done by Martin Seligman and other people who are in the positive psychology movement, um, you know, they, they have these five points uh, of, of what makes us happy and it's called the PERMA model. So it's, you know, positive experiences, which is just basically fun, uh, engagement, which is uh, hard work, relationships, meaning, working for something bigger than ourselves, uh, and, and advancement, you know, getting better today than you were yesterday. And if you think about work, if, you know, a, a good job scratches the, somewhere between three to five of those itches, right? Those five things you need to be happy, a good job will, will meet a lot of those. And we find ourselves in a bit of a vacuum if we retire and just, you know, go play golf all day. So I think it's, it's absolutely, you know, good work that you're doing with your, with your colleagues there early in the book, talking about this crisis of meaning as well as, as the financial preparedness crisis. Yeah, the, the really sad part is Americans tend to be generally pretty good about planning. We plan weddings, uh, bar mitzvahs, sweet 16s. Uh, we, when we set up a business, we tend to write business plans. But I can tell you I've met very, very few people who sit down and write a plan for their life in retirement. Uh, and that's what Alan Spector's wonderful book does a great job of, is setting out a way to help you establish a plan. And he talks about actually practicing that plan to the point of you set up a schedule. Maybe it's uh, 8 to 10 o'clock, you're at the gym taking yoga or Pilates classes or playing pickleball or whatever it might be. Uh, in the afternoon, you work as a candy striper at the hospital or you take courses at the university in whatever subjects might interest you. Uh, you know, those kinds of things, literally laying out hour by hour what you're going to do and maybe on a vacation, take a week and practice it. 
uh, to make sure it's not a fantasy and it's something that will give you that sense of purpose and fulfillment and those social connections you talked about, Danny. So stick, sticking with this theme of, of mapping out a, a life in retirement and, and knowing ourselves, which is, of course, a, a big interest area of mine, you lay out a seven-step discovery process in the book, which made a lot of sense to me. It begins with values and goals and you know, moves on from there to more sort of concrete financial considerations. Uh, but I'm also aware of how poorly we we know ourselves you know i think any student of psychology and i know you are yourself a student of psychology and human behavior and any student of psychology learns pretty quickly that we are poor descriptors of our you know of our motivations we're poor descriptors of our behaviors so how can we or how can advisors uh, help us how can we figure out who we are and what we really want because i think some of us uh, we're so inundated with you know, the world of work and the, the, the corporate culture that we just sort of inherit these values that may not be our own. We just sort of swallow hook, line, and sinker, sort of the values that are in the air. So in this process of mapping out our values and goals, how can we really get to the bottom of, of what we want? Yeah, so I, I'll add one other comment uh, to your statements, which is the easiest person to fool is yourself. Sure. Uh, and uh, so that's an issue. But in the book, uh, we refer to uh, George Kinder's wonderful book, The Seven Stages of Money. I think he, that book does a great job of helping people uh, to figure out their values, or their purpose in life, the other things you mentioned. And he does so by asking some really great questions uh, so we can touch on three of them, I think, are really great for people to make sure they can answer, importantly, sitting down if they're married with their spouse to make sure there's agreement there. Uh, the first is to imagine that you are financially secure. You've got that your financial plan is in place and you have enough money to take care of your needs. How would you live your life? What would you do with the money? Would you change anything that you do um, and just dream about it and describe a life of yours that's as rich as you can make it? Uh, of course, then the idea is to build a plan for your life and your investments to allow you to achieve that goal. The second question, and these next, these next two are related, is we ask people very specifically, we tell them you visit your doctor, it tells you you have somewhere between five and 10 years left to live. The good part is you will never be sick in that period. Uh, so the bad news is you have at most 10 years to live, but you got at least five. The good news is you will be healthy every single day. Uh, and you don't know when you will die. So the question then is, knowing that, what would you do with your remaining time? What would you change in your life, and how will you do that? Again, then figure out how do we build a plan that allows you to hit that bucket list and achieve all the things that you want to do. And the third question is related, which is, your doctor shocks you with the news you have only one day left to live. Think about the feelings that arise and confront your mortality and ask yourself, what dreams did I leave unfulfilled? What do I wish I would have accomplished or had done? Uh, and then figure out a plan to make sure when you do pass away, you you're aren't uh, you, you have achieved those goals. So those are three of the deep questions that we spend hours literally with people and you know, prompting them with further questions to make sure that they have answered them fully and getting the spouses to agree. So con confronting our own finitude and our own mortality is one of the toughest things we can do. There's a, there's a pretty robust body of psychological research that when you ask someone to consider you know, the inevitability of their own death, they tend to get upset, they tend to become more punitive and angry, and things like that. And but it's also I think the, the royal road to insights about what matters to you in life. I mean, the, the reality of our own impermanence is what makes life so precious. 
it what makes it, it's what makes seizing the moment so important. And so I, I absolutely agree that you know considering the fact that we're not going to be here forever and everything's a trade off is a is a really powerful way to go. So I I love those questions. Uh, I love those Kinder questions you shared. Those are those are really wonderful. Yeah, I, we, even at, when my daughter was bar, bar mitzvah and I had to give a speech, you know, offering some sage uh, wisdom uh, to her, one of the things I told her was that to think about life and at the end of it, you will never say, I wish I had. Right. So one of, I'm going to totally forget which philosopher said this, uh, but uh, one of my favorite quotes, like I'm going to, again, space this philosopher. He was asked, you know, what's the secret to living a good life? And he said, spend more time in graveyards, like effectively, you know, spend more time <laughs> contemplating your mortality. So I think it's, I think it's good, good advice. So my, my favorite part of the whole book, because I perhaps have a little bit of an uh, apocalyptic bent, <laughs> You know, yeah. look, I'm from I'm from Alabama. I grew up in a conservative uh, Christian household. I wouldn't I wouldn't be I, I wouldn't be myself if I didn't have a little bit of an apocalyptic bent. But you have a portion of the book uh, that's the Four Horsemen of the Retirement Apocalypse, and I would spend just a few moments talking about those. The the first of these is elevated equity valuations. And so uh, I just spent this morning reading a, a really great piece from Christine Benz that sort of aggregated all of the 10 to 15 year forecasts from the largest asset managers. And in a word, they're all saying kind of, you know, prepare for lower for longer, you know, prepare for anywhere from negative real returns to about 5% a year average was sort of the, the most ambitious any of these large asset managers got. Uh, you base your analysis on the Schiller Cape uh, which has been a, a poor timing mechanism, but a very good predictor at at longer intervals. So understanding, you know, first of all, that that no one knows anything and no one knows anything for certain about what will happen in the next 10 years, but there is, you know, there's reason to believe with at least some degree of probability that equity, uh, high equity valuations will lead to diminished returns over the longer term. What, if anything, do clients do with this information? You know, they hear this and they go, oh, no, you know, stocks are, you know, stocks are dear right now. Should I sell? Should I panic? What, what do clients do with this first horseman? Yeah, so the, the first horseman is, of course, as you pointed out, that equity valuations are much higher than they have been historically. Uh, and obviously, the more you pay, uh, in price for a dollar of earnings, the lower your returns are going to be. Uh, we do know that over the long term, corporate earnings grow at the rate of inflation plus uh, the rate of real growth, roughly. You can't, uh, otherwise, if they can't grow faster uh, than that because otherwise they would become the whole economy and there'd be no wages, uh, right? <laughs> or, or anything, you know, uh, else. So uh, what we do know is this, that the valuations, whether we use what's called the Cape 10, which looks at um, normalizing earnings over a 10 year period. So we're from the bottom of recession, we're not taking the current, P, you know, current earnings and then projecting them forward because that's abnormally low and we're at the end of a boom, then earnings may be unsustainable at that level. So we take a 10 year average. Uh, well, whether you use that 10 year average and adjust it for inflation uh, or you use the current price to earnings ratio or you use a Cape 5 or a Cape 8, uh, there's really no, not much difference. Any of them are as good a predictor of future returns, explaining about 40% of the next 10 year returns. So what that means is that we don't know what the next 10 year returns are. The only right way to think about it is a forecast has to be thought of as the mean of a very wide potential dispersion of outcomes. Think about a bell curve that's fairly flat and wide. So what we do know is this, uh, 
the simple math works in, is to take the inversion of the P-E ratio. So we take an earnings yield like a bond yield. So if we have a 20 price earnings ratio, which is about what you have on the current CAPE uh, or the current uh, P-E of 20, we would invert that to get an earnings yield of 5%. And that's where that figure you mentioned uh, of a 5% optimistic uh, number comes from. Uh, and that's a real expected return. If you think inflation will be 2%, then you would expect the nominal return of seven. That 5% real return is quite a bit less than the 7% real return stocks have earned over the last 90 plus years. Now, what we do know, Daniel, just to make sure that people understand, when you use that 5%, that means there's kind of a 50% chance uh, that'll be more than five and a 50% chance it'll be less. If we get uh, bad news, people don't like stocks, then they demand bigger risk premiums and the PE ratios fall, their earnings may not grow as expected. Uh, and then you get much lower numbers than that. And high PEs like 20 don't mean you can't have even several more years of strong returns, as we've seen over the last three or four or five years when the PE ratios have been elevated and stocks still did well. But that means future returns are likely to be even lower. So what you have to do is plan for any of these wide outcomes from a zero or slightly negative real return, as some are forecasting. I think those are too pessimistic as a base case, but they're possible. Uh, and you have to make sure your plan can sustain that uh, really bad uh, outcome. What I call, uh, we talk about in the book, having a plan B. That means if, if that left tail of the distribution, the bad outcomes happen, what steps are you going to take to make sure you don't run out of money, you're not eating cat food, uh, to use that analogy. So that might mean you move to a lower cost of living area, you downsize your home, you don't eat out every week, whatever it might be, but you build that into your plan today. So if it does happen, you're not panicking, you already know the steps, uh, and know the actions you will be required to take to make sure that you can still live a meaningful and, uh, and pleasant life. I, I like the way that you talked about it as the sort of these forecasts or the mean, uh, the mean prediction uh, and, and to think of it as a bell curve with lock, lots of potentiality to the upside and to the downside. Uh, because a lot of people have been doom and gloom based on high CAPE and PE ratios, like you said, for three, four, five years, and, and things have gone very well uh, on average. Um, but, you know, and that may continue or it, or it may not. And we, we just don't know. And I get a little twitchy, like I get a little nervous when people take historical, you know, long-term historical norms and plug them into their plans as as though they're gospel truth. You know, whether it be you know, 10% uh, 10% uh, gross returns in the stock market or the 4% rule or anything else, uh, a lot can happen, you know, and, and when you become a student of capital markets, you realize that uh, a lot can happen to the upside and to the downside, and you need to be prepared to move some of the levers that you talked about, whether it's reducing your expenses, you know, managing where you live, managing your taxes, you know, all these things I think are important things to keep in mind. So the, the second horseman we want to talk about equally. Uh, uh, Daniel, if we could pause this for a sec, because I do want to make a couple other real quick points. Do on jump this, in. On this issue. So the first thing is we mentioned the current P is about 20, producing a expected real return of five. That assumes the PE will not change, right? And so we know PEs can go higher or lower. Uh, depending upon the risk people perceive. If we get a trade war, for example, that PE could go down. So forgetting even recessions, uh, that's a risk, and that's why we think about the distribution uh, and not consider it as one number. The second point is, I mentioned the Cape 10. When we look at that, 
you have uh, just as good a predictability as the current one year, but the Cape 10 is forecasting, uh, it's actually at about 30, so invert that, you're a little over 3% for a real return, which is less than half the real return uh, of uh, stocks over the long term. So that's more of an apocalyptic uh, possibility because what we do know is high valuations not only mean lower means, but it means the worst outcomes become even worse and the best outcomes become less good. And so the entire distribution of outcomes shifts to the left. Uh, and we, so we have definitely done that. It does not mean, however, as you pointed out, that stocks have to do poorly. There are very logical reasons for valuations to be higher, which I've written about over the years, criticizing all these gurus like Jonathan, uh, uh, Jeremy Grantham and John Husband, who was back as far as 2013, were forecasting stocks are 60, 70 percent overvalued. We're headed for one of the worst bear markets, uh, worse than maybe 08. Uh, and of course, the markets ignored them. And I pointed out a few things. This is helpful to at least people understand that they don't have to be so worried about, quote, high valuations. The first thing is that compared to historical evidence going back 100 years, we look back 100 years, there was no Federal Reserve to help regulate the economy and step in, provide liquidity, et cetera, uh, for the markets uh, to help reduce the risk of recession. We didn't have economic stabilizers like unemployment insurance and Social Security, and the government has become much more willing to step in with fiscal policies. Uh, the country is much wealthier. And the more wealth a country has, then stock prices tend to be higher because it's the wealthy who buy stocks and are willing to take risks. Uh, and we know around the globe, P.E. ratios tend to fall uh, as countries increase in wealth. Uh, we have much better regulatory environment. The SEC uh, you know, has become much stronger and better at uncovering frauds and preventing them. Not 100%, but we have much less risk in the system than we would have done uh, or would have had 60, 70, 80, 100 years ago. So looking at a, 100 years of evidence and saying, well, the Cape 10 is average 17 and now it's 30, uh, you know, that's not really the right way to look at it. If you look even just at the last 50 years, it's more in the low 20s, and there have even been some accounting changes and changes in dividend policies, which would argue for even higher uh, figures than mid, you know, than low 20s. So, but what we do know is high valuations do definitely forecast lower expected returns. Yeah, one of the things you learn quickly when you study markets is that you never walk through the same river twice, you know, for, for all the reasons that you, that you pointed to, you know, economies look different, regulatory environments um, look different, governmental uh, realities look different. And so these are all nice rules of thumb, but you do need to be prepared for a lot of dispersion around even a very reasonable forecast. So m moving on to this second horseman, uh, it's it related. It's low bond yields, which sit at roughly 50% of their historic levels as of, you know, as of the writing of your book. Um, you know, the question, you know, sort of like my question with this, with the stocks is, in a world where where stock valuations are re uh, relatively elevated to, to relative to history, uh, in a world where bond yields are diminished relative to history, should we be doing anything differently? Is you know is there still a place for bonds? Should we be trimming our allocations to stocks, or or is sort of staying the course the best path in, in light of these first two horsemen? Yeah, so great question. Uh, before I answer, I just want to show people uh, how important understanding current valuations are. You know, 
Historically, stocks got 10. We think the numbers are more likely to be in the six to seven, so a four to five percent real return for stocks. So, uh, and bonds historically have got more like five to six, and now you're under two or may call it two. So, uh, if you're uh, sitting there, retiree at maybe a 50 percent stock allocation, well, you used to get. Uh, you could have expected a return like seven to eight percent over the last 90 years. Well, today, at best, you're going to get maybe seven in stocks and two on bonds. That's four and a half, not much more than half. So you cannot rely on the historical data or you're likely to end up falling well short of your goals. You have to be realistic and make assumptions based on the current valuations. So turning to what role the bonds have in this current environment, one of the worst mistakes that we see people make is that they live off of their interest and dividend income rather than taking what we call a cash flow approach or a total return approach. And a cash flow approach can work fine if you're Bond yields of five or six percent and dividend yields historically have been more in the four to five percent area. So you're generating four to five percent of your portfolio as cash flow, and you could live off of that and do fine. Well, today, dividend yields, because corporations are paying out far fewer dividends, uh, which actually makes sense. It's actually dumb for corporations generally pay out dividends. Investors would be much better off if they use the dollars to buy back stock and you could create your own self-dividend, uh, which would be more tax efficient if you need the cash flow. But we see low dividend yields uh, and low interest rates. And so people say, well, I'm only getting a 2% dividend yield, 2% on my bonds, and I need say four or 5% to live on. Now I got to go buy junk bonds or emerging market bonds or invest in real estate investment trusts or other riskier assets. And then the risk shows up. We get a 2008 and all those things drop 40, 50, 60 percent and your whole plan blows up. That's why people need to understand that the role of bonds in the portfolio is to dampen the overall volatility to an acceptable level, one you can live with and sleep with, so your equity risk isn't too great, and take the risk on your equity side. Uh, and if you're going to own any riskier bonds, you will generally, you should be thinking of them as maybe even part of your equity allocation, if you will. We don't invest generally in uh, almost any riskier bonds. We only buy for our clients uh, FDIC and short CDs because they yield much more than treasuries generally. Uh, and uh, AA and AAA rated municipal bonds. Uh, and even there we go beyond that. They not only have to be AA and AAA rated, but they also have to be either essential service revenue bonds or general obligations. We wouldn't buy a AAA rated bond related to a stadium or a healthcare facility because they may not be AAA five or 10 years down the road and you have greater risk of the fall. We want as minimal risk in these as, uh, as appropriate for the use of and the role that bonds play. Well, you know, it's a great point because I think the danger, if the future plays out, like I think many professionals think it will, and we have these, these diminished returns, I think the danger is that people get impatient, people get greedy, uh, and people move up the risk spectrum and start reaching for yield in ways uh, that, are, that are inappropriate or ill-advised. And so it's important to remember that, that bonds ultimately are, are ballast for your portfolio. That's to keep volatility at an acceptable place. 
and to keep you in your seat, you know, as the behavioral guy, I need to chime in and say, you know, a lot, a lot of this is just uh, bonds allow volatility to exist at a level that you can bear the ride. And so to not, to not try and use them for, for more or less than that, I think is, is sound advice. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I'll add one of the other worst mistakes that I think almost all investors make is they think of dividends as income. Uh, no, dividends have nothing to do with income. They are just the company returning their ca- its capital to you, and the stock price drops as a result of that dividend payment. Uh, <laughs> there, there's not that's not income. It's not like a CD that you pay a hundred for and it's paying you two percent. Well, you get your two percent, and the 